Okay. Uh, so let me uh, move on to a little bit of intro on you know what we are going to be studying in this class. Uh, so this class is of course about uh, optical cavities, right? So that's the title. Uh, so as all of you might know from you know basic EM courses, so optical cavities or electromagnetic resonators are in general devices that can find light to small spatial regions, right? So, so the idea is to design some kind of a dielectric distribution in optics, but in different wavelengths, you have different strategies, but somehow be able to uh, design some kind of a permittivity distribution that is able to confine light in very small uh, volumes, right? So that is essentially the definition of an optical cavity from a very loose uh, standpoint, right? And we'll spend the entire class studying about how optical cavities behave, what are their essential properties, what are I mean, some theoretical and uh, you know, analytical models for understanding how these optical cavities um, would respond to incident electromagnetic fields. Uh, but generally speaking, if you were to qualitatively describe two things that happen as a consequence of confining light into small volumes, and that is one of the reasons why there is a lot of technological interest in optical cavities, is that A, the first thing that happens is that you achieve resonant behavior, right? So uh, what you end up achieving is an electromagnetic structure that responds very strongly to certain wavelengths of light. Uh, or certain frequencies, and an electromagnetic structure that doesn't really respond strongly to most other wavelengths or frequencies, right? So you have this strongly resonant response, um, and this response is a consequence of you uh, confining something that satisfies a wave equation in small spatial volumes, right? So it's implicitly due to the wave nature of light, and then confining them in small spatial volumes results in this resonant behavior. And just from a linear optics perspective, so at this level, when we are talking about resonant response, we're not even talking about any nonlinear effects yet, but just from a linear optics perspective, this opens up a lot of possibilities of what you can do with these optical cavities, right? So there is major implications, and we'll study that in this class on linear optics design, right? Just because of this resonant spectral nature uh, of these electromagnetic devices, right? So, so in this class, you'll be looking at how uh, we characterize this resonance spectral uh, resonance uh, behavior, how you simulate it, and what you can do with it within the linear optics regime. So the second implication, which perhaps is somewhat more direct, uh, which we'll explore to in the second half of this class, um, is the fact that when you're confining these fields in very small volumes, you end up invariably enhancing any nonlinear effects, right? So you enhance light matter interaction. So you are able to get nonlinear optics at low energies, and you also open up the avenue for quantum optics, right? Which fundamentally relies on interaction of these electromagnetic fields, a strong interaction of these electromagnetic fields with you know, these localized quantum systems. Um, and a lot of rich physics emerges uh, when, you're, when, you, when you study these um, localized interactions of light with uh, materials, both classically and in, and in the quantum regime. Um, and this rich physics that emerges, uh, so we'll spend quite a bit of time trying to develop models to understand this physics in this class. Um, it also has many, many applications in you know, information processing at both the classical and quantum. Right. So generally speaking, these are the two categories uh, of implications, so to speak, that we will be studying. Right. So we'll start with trying to understand what uh, electromagnetic cavity is, develop some simple theoretical model there, roughly understand its properties, and then go on to study how you can use them for technological applications. So this is a class on, it's an engineering class, it's not really a physics class. So we would not dwell too much on, you know, very theoretical aspects of, you know, cavities. Like we will not necessarily spend a long time studying the properties of uh, solutions of wave equations in these resonance structures, uh, but rather we'll go over that very roughly, very qualitatively, um, and then try and understand how this, uh, these solutions can be used uh, for, you know, very concrete engineering applications in both classical and, uh, and the quantum information uh, realm. Uh, so in terms of the broad picture, uh, so EE has this entire series on courses in integrated optics. So I thought it would be a good idea to give you, um, uh, give you an estimate of where this course lies. So most of the 
devices that we'll study in this class are going to be integrated optics devices. So we are interested in understanding how we can make these optical resonators on chip, right? So of course there is, uh, optics has traditionally for, you know, for a century been off chip bulk optics where you use lenses and mirrors and you can then do a lot of very interesting things with uh, free space optical fields. Uh, but then there is a technological driver to compactifying those uh, devices and putting them on chip, right? Because you want to be able to uh, use the fabrication techniques to fabricate, you know, large optical systems and you want things that are robust and so on, right? So all of these uh, technological motivators want us to pack these devices on chip. And when you go on chip, although the essential physics that you're exploring might seem very similar, um, the uh, the design of these devices becomes a completely different ballgame. So you have to start understanding uh, different physical mechanisms that can give you these resonant responses. And there are a lot of different engineering trade-offs that those physical mechanisms are accompanied by. So uh, one of the goals of this class is really to be expose you to you know, optical resonators on chip. Like from a very theoretical physics perspective, it's very simple. It's just you put like a, a perfect mirror around the region in space and hey, there you have it. There is an optical cavity. But when you actually go ahead and, go ahead and think about design of that perfect mirror, um, especially in, when you're thinking about these on-chip uh, geometries, then you have to spend a lot more time understanding um, all the physical mechanisms, simulation models, and uh, techniques there. So that's going to be one of the main goals of this class. It's really to focus on this integrated optics picture. Um, and in terms of integrated optics, Stanford offers you know, a lot of courses that you can do to fill in the gap, so to speak. So uh, as far as linear optics is concerned, uh, we have uh, a course that Professor Pham teaches on waveguides, and this is a complementary course on cavities. So waveguides and optical cavities put together essentially form the backbone of all linear optics that you can do on chip, right? So you can either have waveguide-based devices or these resonant devices. And combining them, you can pretty much implement any linear transfer function as a function of frequency on your incident optical fields. So once you're done with these linear devices, then of course you also need to build on top of these linear devices, light sources and detectors. So, so you know, then you have, um, how do you design off chip or on chip light sources and how do you detect light flowing in a waveguide once you have done some information processing on top of it. And the third component in integrated optics that's very important are nonlinear optical processes and quantum photonic processes, right? And all of these processes are becoming increasingly interesting in the recent uh, few years, past decades, so to speak speak where there is you know a huge drive towards building quantum information processing systems um, and then you really have to worry about how you can get light to interact strongly with matter and again optical cavities play a very important role over there so in terms of this class, we are mostly going to be focusing on the first and third bracket. So most of our uh, analysis is going to be focused on understanding all optical cavities as linear devices, right? And uh, building models for what all you can do with optical cavities in the linear world. And then we are going to go on to the last part where we are going to talk about, you know, the quantum optics of optical cavities. We won't focus too much on nonlinear optics. There'll be a few classes maybe in which we can, we'll talk a little bit about nonlinear optics, but mostly we are going to be focusing on light matter interaction in the quantum optics regime uh, with these optical cavities, right? So that's where this uh, course fits in uh, with respect to, you know, integrated the different pieces uh, in integrated optics. And if you're interested in other courses as well, please do check them out. So in order to complete your uh, knowledge base of uh, integrated optics. Uh, so, and integrated optics, as enabled by optical cavities, of course, has many, many applications as well. Uh, and we'll be touching upon some of these applications in the class. So you have applications in simple optical communication, so building transceivers and uh, transceivers, uh, receivers and transmitters for uh, optical information systems, right? Uh, or you have different bio applications where you want to be able to sense very precisely different biological molecules or accelerate some biological processes. Again, optical cavities have been shown to have many, many applications in this regime, mostly because of their resonant nature. Um, and finally, in quantum information processing, where these optical cavities can allow you to enhance light matter interaction and unlock different kinds of quantum information processing building blocks, right? So all of these three applications we will roughly touch upon, focusing more on some, less on the others, but you will get an overview of uh, what all of these three different applications look like um, in this class. Uh, 
So this is what, you know, a more precise list of topics that we'll be going through uh, throughout this class. Um, and I think we'll be able to cover most of this, you know, pretty completely. So this is not a estimated list of topic, but a rather precise list of topic. So uh, we'll start with the physics of lossless cavities. So just trying to understand the notion of eigenfrequencies, eigenmodes, and, you know, some simple things about the dynamics of these lossless cavities. And then we'll go into lossy cavities. So lossy cavities are a bit harder to understand theoretically, and you really need to use more simulation tools in order to capture the properties. So we'll discuss some very simple theoretical metrics, you know, like engineer's metrics, like what the Q factor of a cavity is, um, and maybe some more rigorous metrics like density of states and local density of states uh, related to these lossy cavities. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we are going to spend quite a bit of time on the design of cavities. So how do you go ahead and design these cavities, especially at optical wavelengths, so where you're mostly using dielectric systems. So you don't have access to metals, for example, to make perfect mirrors. You need to use dielectrics. So what are the different strategies that you can employ in order to use dielectrics for designing these, uh, designing these cavities? Um, and we're also going to talk about analytical models, like a couple more theory that you can use to roughly understand the behavior of your system instead of resorting to full-blown simulations, right? And that's a very important tool when you're designing and engineering systems of multiple cavities or, you know, multiple components put together, then you need to have some nice way in which you can um, build a circuit theory, so to speak, of these optical systems. And that's where a couple more theory will come into picture. Okay. Um, and then we'll also look at some classical applications, uh, mostly in silicon photonics and nonlinear optics, uh, maybe a little bit on light sources and sensing. That depends on uh, how much time we have and what uh, the interest of the class is going towards. Um, and then the second part of this class is going to be on the quantum physics of the cavities. So um, maybe many of you have not really seen a quantum physics class before, uh, but we are going to be talking about quantization of electromagnetic fields uh, in optical cavities, uh, followed by light matter interaction. So what happens if you bring an electronic system uh, in to interact with an optical system? Um, and what are the different regimes in which this light matter interaction can behave? And then one of the very important applications of these systems is non classical light generation. So we are going to talk a little bit about how electromagnetic engineering can work and, you know, help non-classical uh, non light generation. So this is, you know, a rough list of very precise topics that we are going to be doing in this class. Um, uh, of course, you know, all of this seems very specific to cavities. So some of you might feel that, you know, this class is only useful to people who are doing research in this, ex in this very specific topic. Uh, so while this class is definitely useful to people who are doing research in this very specific topic, uh, there, are, uh, there are a number of general principles that we are going to be developing in this class that you will find useful um, in, you know, other areas of optics, so not necessarily dealing with cavities, but, you know, other areas of um, optics. So, like, things, we'll talk quite a bit about, you know, some general aspects of electromagnetic theory, um, which, of course, we are going to be talking about with an eye out for optical cavities and resonators, but the, but the basic principles being outlined are very general. Um, and how do you model and design integrated optical devices, again, is something that we are going to be talking about. And when we go to the part on quantum optics, and we are going to be talking about concepts like quantization of electromagnetic fields for electromagnetic structure, that's very important, um, not only in, you know, with regards to cavities, but in general, if you're talking about quantum information processing in a variety of different platforms, the resulting models that you get out of quantization are very similar. So we'll study some of those models uh, maybe with an eye out for optical systems, but they apply to other systems as well. And light matter interaction, again, you know, the general uh, behaviors and general principles that will emerge from our study of light matter interactions are actually applicable to many, many different physical systems. So even though in this class, we are going to be focusing on this one specific physical system or a class of specific physical systems, uh, the techniques that are being developed are going to be pretty general. Uh, you will be able to apply them to many different physical systems, uh, you know, within the space of, uh, you know, classical optics or quantum optics or quantum information processing. And you, um, and so you will develop, you know, a general set of tools that would be useful for you in your research, right? Uh, okay, so so that was the introduction on the course topics. So if there are any questions regarding uh, this class, we can uh, talk about that now. Are there any questions? I mean, I know this is all very general. We'll get into more specific details in a minute, but uh, uh, do people have any questions? So I'll pause for a few minutes uh, for, for questions.
Okay. No questions. Any questions on homeworks, logistics? Uh, okay, not really. Um, so, okay, so let's do the following. Let's take a five minutes break. Uh, and then start with the first chapter. So we have quite a bit of the class left. So let's take five minutes break, uh, come back at two. So I'm going to be here. So if you guys want to discuss anything or have any questions, we can do that. Uh, but let's come back in uh, five to 10 minutes and we'll start talking about the first chapter. Uh, oh, by the way, problem set one is online already. So I'm sorry about putting it online immediately, but uh, there are three weeks for you guys to work on it. Um, so if you're interested, if you, if you intend to stay with this class, you can start looking at the problem set as well. Okay, so let's come back in 10 minutes and uh, work on things.
Uh, uh, so should we start or do people need more time? Okay, uh, we can start. Okay, so let's start uh, now. So uh, in the lectures, we are going to be following the course reader pretty closely. So uh, you should keep an eye out on the course reader uh, for any information that you miss in the lectures. And as we said, the lectures are going to be recorded. So that shouldn't be too much of a problem. So what I'm going to do uh, today and the next class is give you a very rough idea of the um, chapter one of course reader, which is classical physics of cavities. So um, this is the only part of the class where we'll talk about these lossless cavities. They are somewhat of an idealization, but they help us understand some basic physical concepts uh, quite easily. Now we will keep this to a mathematical minimum uh, because uh, when we are discussing lossless cavities, there are many levels of rigors that we can do it at. So we're not going to go into too many rigorous details, but rather think of it as an engineer's introduction to uh, these lossless cavities and more of a, uh, focus is going to be on understanding the basic physical properties so that we can uh, apply this to the lossy cavity case. Um, and then uh, towards the end of this chapter, we are going to mostly talk about a little some metrics related to lossy cavities. Okay, so um, uh, as far as the course reader is concerned, so there are two chapters that have been uploaded. So there is a chapter zero, which is, you know, review of ENM. Um, and this chapter essentially goes through basic Maxwell's equations, uh, you know, general properties, plane waves, and so on. So things that you might have seen in a basic ENM class. So we are not going to cover this in the lecture. So I'm happy to answer questions about this in office hours if some of you are not very familiar with this material. Um, but um, you should try and go through this chapter on your own and figure out if there is some part that you're getting stuck at. Uh, so the last section of this chapter is on the T-matrix method. Uh, which you need to implement in your first homework. So definitely see the uh, last section um, and try and implement it in the first homework. Okay, so we are going to start with chapter one, which is uh, uh, classical physics of cavities. Okay, so Okay, so um, essentially uh, our goal here is to understand uh, lossless cavities, right? So cavities that are, so to speak, perfect confiners of light, right? So, um, so how do you make a lossless cavity? We're very roughly speaking, as you know, I alluded to in the introduction, uh, what you essentially do is take an ideal mirror um, and surround a closed region of space in it. Right? Uh, and what would be an ideal mirror? Well, an ideal mirror obviously is an idealization. So we don't really have a very practical device that can be an ideal mirror. We have devices that can go close to ideal mirrors, but never, never perfectly ideal. But a very simple model for an ideal mirror is a perfect electrical conductor, right? So an ideal mirror you can form with a perfect electrical conductor. Right, so if you imagine, and this is a problem that you guys must have solved in a, in, a, um, in a basic ENM class, that if you have a perfect electrical conductor, let's say sitting at x equal to zero, um, and you have a plane wave, uh, exponential i kx, that is going towards this perfect electrical conductor, then this plane wave is going to be reflected with uh, unity uh, reflectivity, right? So, so, the, uh, so the scattered, the, the reflected wave would be minus exponential minus i k x, right? So the negative sign would be because of the boundary condition on this perfect electrical conductor, which would demand the electric field at x equal to zero to be zero, right? So this perfect electrical conductor essentially gives you a perfect mirror. Um, of course, this is not the only choice for a perfect mirror. You can make a perfect mirror out of a perfect magnetic conductor as well right? A uh, perfect magnetic conductor 
uh, so this is of course in the electric field. So the exponential IKX is electric field. A perfect magnetic conductor is going to uh, reflect in phase, but it is still going to reflect with unity probability, right? And then the boundary condition here is that your parallel component of your magnetic field at x equal to zero is equal to zero. Um, and in your homeworks, you will look at a different, uh, uh, another kind of an ideal mirror. That would be one problem in your homework. So if you notice a perfect electrical conductor gives you a pi phase, right? A perfect magnetic conductor gives you a zero phase on reflection, right? So you could ask a question of like, what boundary condition would give me a phase, uh, a phase as determined by, let's say, some kind of a design, but this is a model for an ideal mirror. So suppose I ask myself a question, right? So if I have a mirror, which on exponential i k x ending in a plane wave gives you exponential minus i k x plus phi, plus exponential i phi. So it gives you a phase phi on reflection. What kind of a boundary condition is this described by? So this is described by what is called an impedance boundary condition. And you're going to study this in your homeworks, uh, which is of the form of uh, you know, alpha e at x equal to zero plus beta dE by dx at x equal to zero is equal to zero. So this is again a boundary condition that gives you a perfect phase, but it doesn't give you a zero or a pi phase. It gives you a phase that depends on the coefficients alpha and beta. And you can see that if you take set beta to zero, you get a perfect electrical conductor. If you set alpha to zero, you get a perfect magnetic conductor, right? Because you're either setting the derivative of B to zero, which is proportional to the magnetic field, or you're setting the electric field to zero, which is proportional to, which is the electric field, right? So, so this boundary condition interpolates in between a perfect electrical and perfect magnetic conductor and allows you to access models for perfect mirrors um, with arbitrary phase. So you can use any of these boundary conditions and you can then imagine forming a cavity by placing mirrors all around a specific region in space, right? So let's take a very simple 1D example. Um, so let's take a very simple 1D example. Right. So in 1D, for example, you're going to be putting one mirror, uh, you're going to be putting two mirrors, uh, of course, at x equal to zero and x equal to L. Right. So this gives you, you know, what is called a Fabry barrel resonator. Right. So it's probably the simplest resonator that you can make in a um, and, you know, in, in ENM. Um, or in general, you can, of course, make more complicated 3D resonators, right, where you imagine just blocking off some volume in space, let's call this omega, by a perfect electrical conductor or a, or a perfect magnetic conductor or in general with an impedance boundary condition. Right? So now if you attempt to solve the properties or solve the Maxwell's equation subject to these boundary conditions, which are essentially being applied to all, uh, to, to the entire surface of a, of, a, of a spatial region inside the cavity. So in 3D, it's a volume. In 1D, it's a line segment and you have boundary condition at the endpoints. In 2D, it's an area and you have a boundary condition uh, on, the, uh, on the perimeter of that area. Um, then what you start getting are resonant modes of this uh, of the system, right? And that's a very, very simple exercise to show. So for example, let us consider the 1D cavity. Uh, so let's consider the 1D cavity and attempt to solve Maxwell's equations. So well, we know that the Maxwell's equations is essentially in 1D is just a wave equation. So I have d2e by dx squared plus omega squared by c squared e uh, is equal to zero inside the cavity. Right, and assuming we have a PEC boundary condition, right? So we have a boundary condition E of X equal to zero is zero and E of X equal to L is zero, right? And I'm sure this is an exercise you guys have done countless times in different courses. So I'll just very quickly go over this. So the solution of your, of this differential equation um, essentially gives you A sine omega X by C plus B 
cosine omega x by c. And then you can impose a boundary condition that this is zero at x equal to zero and x equal to L. So E of x equal to zero is just equal to B and this becomes equal to zero. And E of x equal to L is A sine uh, omega L by c. And you choose to set the sine to zero. So you get omega is equal to n pi c by Right, so these are the resonant modes or the resonant frequencies of a cavity, right? So what this immediately tells us is that as soon as I surround an entire volume in space by, by perfect mirrors or perfect electrical conductor, magnetic conductor, or even with that impedance boundary condition, what you'll end up seeing is that if you solve Maxwell's equations and frequency domain and attempt to satisfy the boundary condition by electric field on the, uh, on the boundaries, um, then you will end up having a situation where the frequencies that can exist inside this resonator are quantized. So you can only have certain frequencies, you cannot have arbitrary frequencies. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. There is a there is a slight subtlety to this notion that often gets missed in making the statements, but uh, the point is that the, uh, the eigenvalue problem of frequency domain Maxwell's equations when solved with these uh, perfect boundary conditions uh, gives you eigenvalues that are frequencies um, that are quantized, right? So, and this is what your frequencies uh, look like. Um, and you can, of course, corresponding, so I can label these frequencies by N. N stands for the, you know, the index of the eigenmodes, so to speak. And I can calculate what the electric field profile looks like corresponding to that N by just plugging this in here. So I have A sine uh, omega N X by C, that becomes A sine um, n pi x by l. So, so indeed, you know, this is a problem that you would have solved either in an ENM class or in a quantum mechanics class. So this is the same as the infinite potential well in quantum mechanics. And you get solutions which look exactly the same. Right, so, so I have, I have um, these sign-like solutions. So this is n equal to one, uh, equal to two, and you can sketch others on your own. Right, um, now of course, compared to quantum mechanics, although 1D wave equation looks very similar, uh, one important point to make here is that electromagnetic fields are vectorial in nature, right? Electromagnetic fields are vectors. Right, um, and consequently, uh, for every uh, solution that I've written here, for every N, you will have two modes that can exist, right? So if you account for the polarization of the electric field in this 1D problem, so in the 1D problem, you have a rotational symmetry along x-axis. Right, so if this is our x-axis. We have a rotational symmetry along x-axis and consequently you can choose any direction in the yz plane to be the polarization that you're dealing with and all directions are identical, right? But if you do have to enumerate modes, you need two modes per n, right? So you need two modes per n, per n. Let's say one corresponding to polarized along the y-axis. So one is E is parallel to y hat and one is E is parallel to z hat. And both of these modes have exactly the same resonant frequencies because this problem is symmetric uh, along the, uh, um, on rotation along the x-axis, right? So this, these are two de de degenerate modes. So degenerate is another term that you'll hear quite a lot in this class. Uh, degenerate essentially means that you have the same values of same eigenvalues. In this case, in, our, uh, in, in the context of electromagnetic cavities, eigenvalues refer to the frequencies uh, of your modes. So degenerate means they have the same uh, eigenfrequencies. And in this particular problem, um, the two polarization modes have exactly the same uh, eigenfrequencies, right? Uh, now, there are two important properties of these modes that are extremely useful in a lot of, um, in understanding the physics of these systems very carefully, right? And even when we go to the quantum sections of this class, we're going to come back to these properties and use them. Um, and that is the properties of orthonormality of modes. So that's one property and the other property is completeness. I'll come to that in a minute. And what the orthonormality of modes essentially says is that if you take the electric field due to two different modes, 
right? If you take the electric field due to two different modes, so for our 1D problem, you can, we can explicitly verify that if I take electric field due to let's say N, and if I take electric field due to M, and I integrate it across the length of the cavity, I get a zero if N is not equal to M, right? So if I'm looking at two different modes, then their inner product, which is defined based on the problem that you're looking at, so I'll come on, comment on this in a minute, but they're integral in some sense. There is some inner product that you can form that gives you a zero, right? So this is called, this is the orthonormality of different uh, modes. Okay, and as we'll see in a minute, when we are looking at the dynamics of the cavities, right, when we are looking at how electromagnetic fields will evolve inside a cavity, this orthonormality essentially implies that the electromagnetic field for different modes uh, evolve independently of each other. So you can kind of describe your electromagnetic fields on a basis where you choose to represent them on different modes and independently and, and, the, and the coefficients of these different modes, so to speak, will decouple uh, when we consider the dynamics of an electromagnetic cavity. So we'll come to that point. So I just write it down here. So this, this, uh, this implies that the modes are physically independent, so to speak. Right, so again, this is a very loose way of um, saying what orthonormality means, but that's what essentially what it means, right? So as long as you're looking at a linear problem, so you're constraining yourselves to Maxwell's equations uh, without accounting for any nonlinearities as such, then orthonormality essentially applies that these modes are not going to interfere with each other. They're just going to evolve separately. And if you want to calculate the net field, you just add up the fields due to the two different modes, right? Um, the second property is completeness. Um, now, uh, this is uh, a rather technical property, so I don't want to go too much into the details of, you know, what we precisely mean by completeness of these modes that would take us on a, a somewhat of a tangent uh, relative to this course. And for the purposes of this course, right, um, and this is, you know, how physicists deal with this completeness issue all the time, um, is that we will just assume, uh, the statement that we are going to make here is that if you look at any physical field that can be created inside the cavity, so, so imagine, you know, you imagine you have a current source uh, inside a cavity, right? And that it creates a field inside the cavity. And you know, the field, the current source uh, need not really excite just one mode. It can in general excite multiple modes, but whatever field that it is creating, you can always write as a superposition of, uh, of these modes. So if you have any electric field that is physical inside the cavity, then you can write this as a superposition uh, with some coefficients uh, 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 of these modes in the end of x. Okay, uh, so this is a completeness property. Um, and of course, by physical, one immediately means that this has to respect boundary conditions. Right, so the field that you are trying to write as a superposition of these modes needs to be, let's say for a PEC cavity, it has to be zero on the boundaries of the PEC cavity. For an impedance boundary condition, it has to satisfy the impedance boundary condition. Uh, but as long as you respect this boundary condition, you would be able to find these coefficients that, uh, that make this um, exact, right? Um, now, I call it physical, but that, that is actually very restrictive. So if you study these properties more in detail, what you will realize is that this, actually the electric fields don't need to be differentiable per se to I'll permit such a representation. Um, so they're not, so not, they don't necessarily need to be physical. So there are, you know, mathematical caveats here. Uh, but as far as, uh, you know, for the purposes of this class, from an application standpoint, we are concerned, any electric field that you're going to encounter, if it happens to be inside a lossless cavity, you should feel free to do this decomposition without thinking about it, right? Um, of course, if you're doing a mathematics class, you might have to think more about it, but not in, not in our class, right? So, so this is, uh, from our perspective, any electric field inside a lossless cavity can be written as such, right? Of course, we're not going to be studying lossless cavities for the majority of this class. We're going to go on to lossy cavities and so on, where you know, all of these notions break down a bit, but if you're working with lossless cavities, um, uh, this holds. Okay, um, and uh, so of course, uh, you know, these I have written is for the PEC cavity under question. So this is for the PEC cavity uh, Fabry Perot, right? Uh, when you are looking at uh, more general problems, so if we consider a more general problem, uh, 
So for example, a 3D PEC cavity, right? Then, um, then of course this doesn't hold anymore. This is a very specific solution to the Fabry Perot PEC cavity. Uh, the eigen modes written down here also don't hold anymore. Uh, but these properties that we have written down still holds with minor modification. So let us consider a very general problem where you have a PEC cavity, you know, with PEC boundary condition. Uh, omega, uh, partial omega, and there is some permittivity distribution epsilon of x, which is real because we're talking about lossless cavities, so real, which exists inside uh, this cavity region. Um, then, you know, instead of solving, instead of solving uh, this wave equation here, right, the simple Helmholtz equation, uh, you need to solve the vector version of this Helmholtz equation, which essentially uh, reduces to from Maxwell's equation del cross del cross is equal to omega squared by c squared epsilon times uh, epsilon times e, right? So this just comes from Maxwell's equations, right? I mean, if any one of you have any questions, please feel free to uh, ask me. I would like to keep these as interactive as possible. It's somewhat of a hard task given our medium of communication, but if you find that any of the things that I'm talking about are not familiar, you haven't seen them before, please interrupt me and ask, right? So a lot of the things that we are doing right now are basic electromagnetics. So I'm not going, I'm not going to derive everything, but if, you're in, if you want to know more details, please you can message me privately on chat as well um, and we can go through stuff in more detail. Okay, so this comes from frequency domain Maxwell's equations. Right, so it's a vector wave equation. It's very similar to um, you know the scalar wave equation. It just happens to be a little bit more complicated. And if you solve this subject to boundary condition, right, which is essentially that E, um, that it's a PEC boundary condition, so E parallel uh, on partial omega vanishes, right, on the on the surface, which is partial omega vanishes. So this is the surface, right. Then you end up again getting a very similar property that your resonant frequencies only take certain discrete values, right? So there are very few problems in which you can solve these discrete values analytically, um, but uh, you can numerically solve this problem for almost arbitrary surfaces, right? There are different formulations that you can use to solve this eigen problem numerically. But one of the things that really holds is that you still get these discrete uh, eigen frequencies. There'll be infinite number of them in general, but they'll all be discrete. Right, and you also get corresponding to these discrete frequencies, you get uh, discrete modes, right? And these modes again satisfy an orthonormality condition, but that orthonormality condition now is not a simple integral. So, this was in the case of a 1D PEC Fabry Perot cavity, uh, but in a more general case, these conditions essentially reduce to um, something like this. Uh, or let's say if I index them by n uh, and I have m of x and I integrate this over the entire volume, this is equal to delta n comma m. Yeah, so question. Um, so uh, why do you emphasize you are doing things inside the frequency domain and solve the eigenvalue equation? Uh, could you specify what kind of eigenvalue equation you are solving? Well, this is the eigenvalue equation sitting right here. Yeah, um, so why, why you have to do that within the frequency domain? Um, so frequency domain and time domain are equivalent. Uh, so in a minute, we'll go into and study the time domain picture of these cavities as well. Um, so frequency domain, it's just a choice, right? So um, whenever you're studying electromagnetic scattering problems, you start by looking at them in frequency domain, right? So for example, even when you think about plane wave transmission reflection problem, you're always thinking about them in frequency domain. And when you want to understand the time domain uh, from a theoretical standpoint, the typical idea is to express your time domain fields, let's say the superposition of different frequency domain fields. Um, and since we understand individual frequency domain fields, we can kind of tell what happens to the time domain field. So this is just a choice uh, for now. So for now, let's just say that I choose to study the frequency domain properties. In a minute, I will connect them back into the time domain properties, and then I think uh, it will be much clearer. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Okay, are there any other questions? 
So if I'm going too fast or too slow, you have to tell me. Um, uh, any other questions or all of this is fine? No questions? Okay. Uh, Excellent. So anyway, feel free to interrupt me. Otherwise, I feel that we'll finish this course in half the time that is allotted for this class. Uh, if you guys don't interrupt, of course, the problem sets will then be a struggle. So that's not as good as one would imagine. So please feel, feel, uh, please feel free to interrupt me with any questions. Okay. So, so this becomes the orthonormality condition for the modes uh, of our cavity. Uh, so there is a proof of this in the course readers. I'm not going, so you can read that proof. It's a very simple proof. It requires, well, proof as in, you know, heuristic proof of sort, not a very rigorous proof because that's, it's more complicated. Uh, but there is, you know, a rough sketch of how you would go and prove this in, uh, in, in the course reader. So you can read the course reader for, um, uh, for more precise details on where this comes about. Um, but this is a property that is generally satisfied for you know, these lossless cavities, right? So you have discrete modes and these discrete modes are orthogonal to each other. And uh, so this is the orthonormality property. And uh, of course the completeness property still holds as is. So completeness, again, if we take a vector field E of X, which satisfies the boundary condition, Which, is, which we are choosing to be the PEC boundary conditions right now, then I can write this as a sum of these uh, eigenmodes. Okay, um, so this is again possible. So one important right. So in general, of course, in most practical problems, you're going to have to need infinite sums to get the series to converge to E of X in a very specific sense. Um, but, uh, the, uh, but of course, in practice, you can always truncate the sums and use you know, finite number of them, finite but large number of them, right? So, so both the orthonormality and completeness properties are properties very, very specific to these uh, lossless uh, cavity systems, okay? So let me summarize what we talked about. So, so in summary, when we talk about loss, lossless cavity, lossless cavity, right? So the key takeaway is that they are typically due to, typically due to a PEC, uh, PMC or an impedance boundary condition, right? Um, so I have focused on the PEC boundary condition, but very similar statements can be made for PMC and impedance boundary condition. And uh, as you work through the homework, you'll uh, understand how to deal with these you know, different boundary conditions more carefully. Second is that they have a discrete set of eigenfrequencies. on solving the frequency domain problem. Sorry. Right, and then the modes, uh, the electric fields or rather, um, electric fields corresponding uh, to these modes to these solutions are orthonormal and complete, right? So these are, you know, the three properties that, um, or you know, three things that I have generally you know, discussed in the past uh, 20 to 30 minutes, right? Um, so uh, maybe you've seen this before, maybe not. So, but they are outlined in greater detail in chapter uh, in the in the course reader, so you can always go and study it on your own. Okay, so uh, this is how it goes. Uh, so this is you know the spectral properties of a lossless cavity. So the next thing that we want to understand, and as I show kind of um, uh, alluded to, is what are the frequency domain properties uh, of these uh, of these cavities. Sorry, the time domain properties uh, of these cavities. Right. So let's start looking at the time domain. Property question. Uh, yes. So uh, the previous property uh, is any of them closely linked with the lossless property? Because uh, from the derivation, I didn't see any part that you use the lossless property. Yes. So I haven't proven anything here. So uh, as I said, this is more of me giving you information, right? Um, so we can do one simple exercise uh, for that. Uh, let me. Sorry. 
let me try and add team page. Okay, so so we can do one simple exercise. So for example, um, so how do we prove this for um, not the full problem, but maybe for a simple one D problem? Right, so this is a very standard technique uh, for proving uh, these orthonormality. Uh, so let's say we take two modes. So in 1D, first of all, so 1D we are working with simple wave equations with omega square by C square, uh, epsilon of X, uh, E of X is equal to zero, right? So let's consider a problem where you have PEC boundary condition at X equal to zero, uh, at X equal to L, with some permittivity distribution in the middle. Right, so this is not a problem that you can in general solve analytically, but the orthonormality condition still holds. So how does that happen? So this is a simple proof of orthonormality, let's say. So, so you can consider two modes, d to e n by dx square plus omega n square c square epsilon x E n x is equal to zero, uh, d to e m by d x square plus uh, omega m square by c square epsilon x e m x is equal to zero. So what you could do is you could take the first equation, uh, multiply this by e m of x and then integrate, right? So then you get something like e m of x d to e n by d x square d x zero to l plus omega n square by c square epsilon x e m x e n x d x is equal to zero, right? And you can do the same thing with the second equation, but you multiply with e n x and integrate, right? So then you get zero to l e n x, Right, and now if you subtract the two, what you get is omega n squared minus omega m squared by c squared. Dx plus an integral zero to L emx d2 en by dx squared minus e n x d2 e m by d x square d x is zero, right? And now if you just look at this term, uh, this term is nothing but zero to L d by d x dn by dx minus en and dem by dx, right? So this is very easy to show. If you just open up this derivative, you'll get what's on the top. And what you immediately see from here is that this actually evaluates to the difference because this is the integral of a derivative. It evaluates to the difference of this quantity inside the integral. Um, evaluated at the two endpoints, so on the surface of your cavity, so to speak. So you get EM uh, of L, the derivative of EN at L, minus uh, EM of zero, derivative of EN of zero, minus EN of zero times derivative of EN of zero, right? So now, if you're working with a PEC problem, for example, if you're working with a PEC problem, then you can see that the electric fields at L are vanishing, electric fields at zero are vanishing. So for a PEC problem, right? And so we immediately get that this, this term is zero and consequently you get that this guy is equal to zero, which implies orthonormality if omega n and omega m are unequal, right? Which uh, if omega n and omega m happen to be equal, well, in that case, you have degenerate mode, so you can choose them to be orthonormal. So then you can explicitly 
take two modes that satisfy the, the orthonormality condition, right? Because you can choose any linear combination of those modes to be your modes. And that, that would be just like the case where you're choosing two polarizations as your modes as opposed to two polarizations that are not orthonormal to each other, right? But if omega n and omega m are not equal, then this immediately implies that this integral vanishes. Right, and you can see that while for PEC this works, the, it even works for PMC because your E n derivative is also zero. So, so PMC implies that the magnetic field, which in this one D case is just a derivative of the electric field, vanishes. Right. So for a PMC as well, you'll see that you know the orthonormality property holds. And I'm going to leave this for you to work out if you can take the more general impedance boundary condition and still show that this orthonormality property holds if you plug in the impedance boundary condition um, at the two ends. Does this make sense? Is this, is this clearer now? Uh, yeah, yeah. Right, so, so the boundary conditions are intimately linked with this property, of course. Um, so while I've shown this to you for a very simple uh, you know, 1D problem, uh, you can repeat a very similar exercise for this 3D problem. You will need to use bipods for these you know, more complicated vector functions, but uh, it, is, it, is, it is literally following the same process. Um, okay, now any other questions here? Okay, great. So, uh, so, so what we are interested in understanding in these time domain properties is what happens if you take this electromagnetic cavity, which is, you know, again, a region in space where I've put some kind of a PEC or PMC boundary condition around it, and I, um, and I uh, excite it with some source, right? And I'm interested in looking at how the, uh, the, um, the fields inside the cavity evolve with time. Right. So, so the setup that we are very generally looking at is that you have a cavity, let's say, with some PEC boundary conditions. Okay. Um, and I put a source J of X inside. And let's say the source is a function of time. Right, so we are we are in general considering a problem where things are changing with time, and I'm interested in understanding how the electric field. inside the cavity uh, cavity evolves okay and what can we say about it so fundamentally we are looking at maxwell's equations in time domain so we want to be able to say something about how maxwell's equations in time domain work right so uh, if you guys remember the maxwell's equations in time domain in general read um, I always make a mistake here, but uh, with respect to my plus minus signs, but I think it was this. Right, so you have these couple differential equations for electric and magnetic field that you're interested in solving, uh, which of course you could convert into a single different uh, bar PDE for just electric field, uh, which is what is more convenient to work with, which is del cross del cross E of X comma T. Um, sorry. Right, plus um, epsilon of x my c square del two by del t square is minus mu naught del j x comma t by del t. Right. So so this would just be trying to eliminate uh, h x comma t from above. Right, and you end up with an equation completely in it. Now, um, of course, this is you know an equation that's completely valid for any electromagnetic field that can be set up inside the cavity. But let's try and um, break this down into a simpler uh, set of equations. And for that, let's start by using the completeness property of the cavity mode. So let's use completeness first. 
So remember, because this is a PEC cavity, it is going to have some modes at frequency omega one, omega two, omega three, dot, 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 and it'll have some electric fields E1, E2, E3, uh, dot, 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 that are oscillating at the frequency that you calculate. Um, and E x comma t is going to be a field that is going to exist inside the cavity, right? It is going to be a field that's changing as a function of time, but it is still a field that exists inside the cavity. Furthermore, it is going to satisfy the PEC boundary conditions at all times, right? So because this PEC boundary condition stays all the time, the electric field is supposed to go to zero, the tangential component is supposed to go to zero at all times, right? So consequently, I should be able to, because my modes are complete, expand and this E x comma t onto these uh, cavity modes. So I should be able to write E of x comma t as a superposition of these, uh, of these cavity modes, right? So now notice what I've done. So I'm using completeness. So I'm writing E x comma t as a superposition of these modes E n of x. But the modes that we calculated are not time dependent, right? The modes that we calculated are just functions of space. So they came by solving, um, solving this equation. There is no time dependence in that equation at all, right? <coughs> so, so these are functions of space, but what I'm doing is I'm expanding a function of space and time onto functions of space. So which would mean that the coefficients that I'm using for the expansion have to be functions of time. So when I write down my electric field as a superposition of this cavity modes, uh, the time dependence is transferred completely on the coefficients that I have, uh, that I'm multiplying with the superposition, right? So you can think of this essentially as expanding E of x comma t at each time, at each time t onto the cavity mode basis. Right? And so consequently, the time dependence of the electric field is now captured by the time dependence of these uh, of of the coefficient by a n of t, okay? So now when we plug this back in here, we should be able to translate this differential equation into a set of differential equations for a n of t, right? And that is actually done very easily. So let's try and see what each of the terms is. So if you look at del cross del cross e, then this, because this is an operator that only acts on space, so it only acts on space, this becomes a n of t times del cross del cross e n of x. And I know that this is just omega n squared by c squared epsilon x e n of x, right? Because these e of x individually satisfy uh, our eigenvalue equation right here. Right, so del cross del cross is just omega squared by c squared times epsilon, right? And what about del two e by del t squared on e? Well, this is only, this only acts on time. So this is going to leave the, del, the e n of x untouched from here. So this is going to leave this portion untouched and just gives you double derivative of a n of t multiplied by e n of x. Right, so now if I plug it back into my original equation, so, so now plug these guys back here, what you end up getting is a sum over a n of t, oh, sorry, right, sorry. So you, you end up getting um, epsilon x, uh, e n of x, divided by c squared, right, uh, times double derivative of a n of t plus omega n squared a n is equal to the right hand side, which is minus mu naught del j by del t, right? So we get like, uh, so this is what it looks like when I plug in on using completeness. So I just use the fact that my cavity modes are complete and I try to see what my Maxwell's equations would give me. Now, as a next step, let me use orthonormality, right? So now uh, what I'm doing still is I'm summing over different modes. So let me multiply 
by e m star of x and integrate. How do you get this equation? Ah, I just I, I just plug del cross del cross and del two into the original Maxwell's equations. Uh, the previous one. Yeah. So this is what we are trying to solve, right? So this is the equation that governs the dynamics of the electric field inside the cavity. Maxwell's equations. Uh, what we are using here is just the fact that your electric field modes are complete. Your modes of your cavity are complete. So I can write E as a superposition of these modes. And now what I've done is then I've tried to figure out what the original dynamical equation for Maxwell's, uh, for, from Maxwell's equations, what does this imply about the dynamics of these coefficients, right? That's the goal. <clears throat> So now if you multiply by EM star and integrate, what you end up seeing is that on the left-hand side, you're, you only pull out uh, N equal to M, right? So because, so recall that integral of epsilon of X, EN of X dot EM star of X D3X is equal to delta n comma m, so it's, uh, it's zero unless n is equal to m. So on the left-hand side, I essentially get sum over n, one by c squared delta n comma m. is minus mu naught integral epsilon x e m star dot del j by del t uh, d three x, right? So I just multiply both sides by em star x integrate and I use the orthonormality and what immediately this gives me is a simple da uh, because when I sum over delta n comma m I'm obviously just picking out m is equal to s m of t right so where is minus mu naught c square integral of epsilon x E m star of x. Uh, sorry, we don't have an epsilon x here. Apologies. Hmm. Okay, so this is what we end up getting. So this is a very important result. So what this is telling me is that on using completeness and orthonormality, what I can do is by using completeness, I can write the electric field as a superposition of the individual fields, right? I can write the electric field as a superposition of fields corresponding to each independent mode of the cavity that you compute from the frequency domain problem, right? So each eigenmode of the cavity multiplied by a set of coefficients which are time dependent. So I am representing the field by simply its projection on the cavity modes. And when I look at what dynamics is implied by Maxwell's equations on these coefficients, right? So if I plug this, uh, this expansion into Maxwell's equations and look at what equation I get for an of t, I get a simple harmonic oscillator equation. Right, so this is just a simple harmonic oscillator. So with each cavity mode, we can associate a simple harmonic oscillator. And those harmonic oscillators oscillate independent with each other. So as you can see, the equation for AM is completely decoupled in the absence of, um, let's say, any nonlinear effect or in the absence of any other perturbations. If you're just looking at the cavity mode, if you use the actual modes of the cavity, then each mode is associated with a simple harmonic oscillator that is completely decoupled from all the other harmonic oscillators. You can see the dynamics of AM only depend on AM. They don't depend on the other cavity modes, right? Um, and the source is, in general, feeds every harmonic oscillator, right? So this source for the mth harmonic oscillator depends on the overlap of the current source with the electric field of that harmonic oscillator, right? So, uh, so this is, one key result is that the dynamics of this lossless cavity can just be thought of as the dynamics of, um, you know, large number of simple harmonic oscillator. Now, for those of you who have seen quantization of electromagnetic fields before, I think, for example, in Professor David Miller's class, if any one of you have done E2 and E3, then there as well in the quantization, you see that you can write the dynamics of a the electromagnetic field in the quantum regime as the dynamics of 
different harmonic oscillator. And this is the exact same thing, but happening in the classical regime itself, right? So the dynamics of a lossless cavity are equivalent to dynamics of a bunch of harmonic oscillators. So we are going to stop here. I think we're out of time now. Uh, so we are going to, from in the next class, look at some uh, implications of this harmonic oscillator equation. And you'll see what happens when you drive cavity on resonance and off resonance. And then we'll go into a rough introduction on uh, some basic properties of, uh, of lossless cavities. Uh, okay, great. So I'll, I'll stop here for now. I'm going to upload this uh, these notes uh, and the video uh, online so you guys can look at it. And as I said, this is chapter two of the course notes, uh, sorry, chapter one of the course notes. So you guys can go and read about this um, in the course notes as well. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to post on Piazza or we can discuss at the beginning of the next class. Okay, great. So thank you for attending the class. Uh, so see you next Thursday, coming Thursday. Okay. Uh,